Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Interagency Task Force on the Arts and Human Development public webinar for February 20th, 2013. Uh, thank you for all for joining us. Uh, just, this is Sunil Iyengar, uh, Director of Research and Analysis at the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm going to just uh, run through a few housekeeping notes and then we'll begin. Uh, first, you all are muted and will be able only to hear us. Um, this webinar will be posted in the podcasts, webcasts, and webinars section of our website, arts.gov, in a few days, so you can refer to it in the future. Again, that's arts.gov. Um, and the, the last half hour of the webinar will include a Q&A session. You can submit questions or comments at any time during any of the presentations today using the Q&A box below the PowerPoint on your screen. We'll do our very best to address as many as possible during the time we have. And please do not use the raise hand button on your screen. Instead, uh, as I said, just submit the questions or comments through the uh, Q&A box below the PowerPoint that will appear. Um, and uh, just a note to my fellow presenters, um, for those of you out there uh, presenting, uh, please uh, remember to unmute your phone when it's your turn to speak. Thanks a lot. OK, so we'll get started. So I'm here to give you a very brief update on the work of the Interagency Task Force on the Arts and Human Development, which was started in late 2011. Um, this is uh, our first uh, webinar of this year uh, that we do. And as, as, as many of you know, we've been doing this on a quarterly basis to share information and evidence about uh, the arts in human development, uh, particularly positive social, economic, uh, civic kinds of outcomes that are generated through the arts in various uh, phases of human development. Um, and our speakers here, I'm very pleased to say we have with us uh, Marie Bernard, Deputy Director of the National Institute on Aging, a task force member. Another task force member, Elizabeth Nielsen, who's the program director of the Division of Behavioral and Social Research within the National Institute on Aging. Uh, Marie will be talking first about uh, a report and uh, the results of a workshop we co-sponsored, the NEA and the NIA co-sponsored um, recently, and a uh, report that will be released today. Um, and Liz Nielsen, who will follow up, will be talking about a grant opportunity available at the National Institute on Aging that is very germane to this topic of, of looking at the arts as an intervention in older adults to improve health and quality of life. Uh, then we'll be followed by Julian Johnson, who's a researcher out at the University of California, San Francisco, who's actually a grantee uh, from the National Institute of Unaging, who will be talking about some of her work, and she's act she actually is studying choral music participation among older adults. And finally, we'll hear from Marla Bush, another task force member who's who, from the Office of External Affairs within the Administration on Aging and the Administration for Community Living at the Department of Health and Human Services at the national level. So we'll be hearing from these speakers, and then we'll have, as I said before, about half an hour of Q&A. And again, we welcome any comments or questions, and we'll conclude then. So um, just to give you a brief update on where we've been lately, uh, in, today, uh, we'll, we'll see the release actually today, not the 22nd, of the Arts and Aging Building the Science Report, uh, which is, summarizes the proceedings of a workshop you'll be hearing about. Uh, the NIH, through the, uh, the, that is the National Institutes of Health through the National Institute on Aging, and a couple of other NIH entities co-sponsored this workshop with the National Endowment for the Arts back in September of last year. And based on the findings of that workshop, which involved a lot of discussion as well as paper presentations on research gaps and opportunities to study the arts in aging, uh, based on those findings, the, the report uh, for, uh, sets forth some recommendations and ideas for future research in this area. And Marie will be talking a little bit about our joint attempts to try to build up capacity and scale up this kind of research going forward through opportunities for the public. Um, next, uh, just to let you know that the workshop uh, yielded a lot of resources, not just the report which is being released today, but in fact, uh, the full transcript and PowerPoint slides from the workshop are available at this link below. And you don't need to hurry and try to write it all down right now. Just be, as I said, the, this presentation will be archived. So you can go back to it and get the proper link and click on it. Um, similarly, there's an archived video over the workshop. So you can actually watch all of it uh, online at this address here. 
And we are in talks right now with several of the authors from the papers. There are about five commissioned papers from the workshop, and about three of them I know are being prepared for publication in a peer-reviewed journal, at least three of them. So we're looking forward to sharing the results of that effort as well. And this will be a way, I believe, to circulate these findings in the right channels, that is to say, in the scientific community that is accustomed to evaluating evidence regarding uh, gerontology and the arts. And finally, uh, just to let you know, to keep you keep very much in mind that the NEA and the NIH, including the other co-sponsors, such as the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine at the NIH, as well as uh, the Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research and the National Institute on Aging, of course, are all deliberating next steps. So more to come. So the task force, as many of you know, is concerned with understanding the arts and uh, really what the evidence tells us about the effects of the arts at various stages of human development. So having talked and, and spending some time on this webinar talking about the older adult population in the arts, I did want to let you all know that we are also focused on, as it were, the other side of the spectrum of arts and human development, looking at childhood, early childhood in particular, but also youth and adolescence. And so one of the projects the task force has before it is a subgroup will be conducting a literature review and gap analysis uh, with the help of the NIH library to understand uh, opportunities in a similar way that we just did for older adults, uh, but this time for this population. And with, we're having, thankfully, we're having the help of task force members belonging to the Administration for Children and Families at the Department of Health and Human Services, as well as the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development within the, the NIH. And finally, the NEA is currently in the process of developing survey questions to be added to a large-scale study, uh, the National Children's Study. And this study uh, really assesses many factors pertaining to early childhood development and adolescence, and it's just getting started. And in fact, we are looking at developing some questions to assess uh, music exposure, uh, particularly music at first, but perhaps other arts eventually uh, during early childhood development and positive outcomes or negative outcomes, to be honest, that may occur later in life. So to try to understand how to evaluate uh, the sort of potential causal relationship between the arts and human development uh, starting with early childhood. So some final general updates. Very pleased to announce that we've gained a new task force member in Tracy Gaudet, who's director of the Office of Patient-Centered Care and Cultural Transformation at the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. That brings the number of participating agents, federal agencies and departments uh, to roughly uh, 15 currently, um, and more information is available on our website. Um, and I also want to note that NEA and one of our task force colleagues, the director of the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, which I just mentioned a while ago, co-presented recently at an Arts and Health in the Military National Roundtable uh, sponsored by the Global Alliance for Arts and Health and, the Amer and Americans for the Arts. Uh, and so that, that it, we'll, we'll have more information, I'm sure, later on to report out of, out of that effort. Um, we also are continuing this public webinar series every quarter, and so please stay tuned. In April 17th, uh, we'll be announcing uh, the speaker lineup for that webinar and then future webinars. And finally, for more information about the work of the task force, please email this address, fedtaskforce at arts.gov, or you can visit a brand new web page launching today at this address, arts.gov slash national slash task force. Again, all this information, including the web links, will be available in an archive presentation. So now, without further ado, I'd love to turn it over to Dr. Bernard, who will speak about uh, the workshop that we had the pleasure of co-sponsoring back in September on research gaps and opportunities for exploring the relationship of the arts to health and well-being in older adults. Marie? Um, thank you very much, Neil, uh, and it's a pleasure to get an opportunity to talk with you today. As he said, I will be talking about this workshop that was sponsored in September, and the title of the workshop is as listed on the slide. Um, the objectives um, in the few minutes I have will be to talk about our overall experience work with the workshop and to talk about our shared commitment for going forward. Um, this workshop came about, um, again, as has been mentioned earlier, but just to reinforce, and for those of you who have not previously participated in one of these webinars, uh, as a result of um, collaboration between the National Endowment for the Arts and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. 
Um, this uh, was launched with the release of the NEA white paper on the arts and human development that came out in March of uh, 2011. It was followed by a convening of um, uh, representatives from the Department of Health and Human Services and the National Endowment of Arts, some 14 different member agencies and departments. And we, when we all got together, it became clear that our first task uh, should be a systematic literature review and gap analysis to determine where the evidence is with regards to relationship between arts and human development and where there might be some opportunities for further elaboration. Uh, one end of the spectrum certainly is aging. And um, as a result of outreach from NEA um, to NIH, uh, the National Institute on Aging, the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, and the Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research collaborated to uh, develop the workshop that uh, took place in September. Uh, the workshop uh, was also another partner, and that was the National Academies uh, that uh, really was responsible for the actual logistics of the meeting. Um, there were several goals for the workshop. Uh, first, to develop effective interventions to maintain health and function and prevent or reduce the burden of age-related diseases, disorders, and disabilities. Uh, secondly, we were interested in understanding uh, and developing strategies to enhance societal roles and interpersonal support for older adults, reduce social isolation, and prevent elder abuse. And we were interested in increasing awareness and promoting the adoption of interventions to improve the health and quality of life of older people. To that end, the uh, meeting itself ended up having four themes. Uh, one was the relationship of arts programs and interventions to psychological well-being, cognitive, sensory, and motor skills function in older adults, and the underlying neural processes. Second theme was a comparison of benefits or weaknesses of arts therapies over other behavioral and or pharmacological interventions for older adults experiencing declines in cognitive, sensory, and or motor ability. A third theme was looking at cost-benefit analyses associated with the inclusion of arts programs and interventions in healthcare delivery for older adults. And lastly, uh, looking at the relationship of aesthetics and design factors to health and quality of life related outcomes of older adults in long-term care and assisted living facilities. We had a star-studded group of presenters. Um, the chair of the meeting was uh, Dr. David Rubin uh, from University of California in Los Angeles, and I'm not going to steal the thunder of the release of the um, uh, summary of the meeting. I would really encourage you to take a look at the summary, the PowerPoint slides. It, it was a very nicely done meeting, very high level consideration of the evidence. The last thing I'll talk about is our commitment for going forward. Uh, we as a group uh, see uh, great opportunities for further understanding the relationship of arts to aging. Um, and there are a number of uh, potential routes by which scientists, uh, partnering with artists, or maybe the scientists and artists are one and the same person, uh, applying to the National Institutes of Health uh, for funding to uh, further pursue those uh, questions. Uh, I will therefore uh, turn the podium over to my colleague, Dr. Liz Nielsen, who's going to highlight one of those opportunities that's currently available. Thanks, Marie. Uh, this is Liz Nielsen. I'm a program officer in the Division of Behavioral and Social Research at the NIA, and I want to tell you about a particular NIA research opportunity, which is entitled Translational Research to Help Older Adults Maintain Their Health and Independence in the Community. Now, the purpose of this funding opportunity is to solicit R01 and R21 research applications. That's large programmatic uh, grant applications as well as somewhat smaller exploratory developmental applications to uh, aid in the translation of evidence-based research findings toward the development of new interventions, programs, policies, practices, and tools that can be used by community-based organizations to help elderly individuals remain healthy and independent and live in their own homes and communities. 
these kinds of applications should involve collaborations between academic research centers and community-based organizations that have expertise in serving the elderly in order to help communities be better poised to respond to the needs of their aging populations. These uh, applications can, I mean, these funding announcements can be linked to with the links provided here, or you can simply Google uh, PA for program announcement-11-123 or-11-124 and find the full description of what the requirements are for submission. So the NIA was motivated to issue the, these program announcements because recent years have really seen an explosion of fundamental insights in the social and behavioral sciences. And what's really become important is translating this kind of uh, basic knowledge into practical advances that can benefit older people. Uh, and this has become an increasing priority at the NIA, where we recognize that health and well-being are not just addressed in the clinic uh, and in the biomedical context, but also through interventions into people's everyday lives. So what kinds of applications are appropriate for this opportunity? Those applications that involve the translation of evidence-based research. And what do we mean by that? Well, evidence-based research that's used in applications submitted to this uh, translational funding announcement should have the following characteristics. They should have been tested. The findings should have appeared in the peer-reviewed scientific literature. And there should have been demonstrated reliable links between the hypothesized mechanisms and the outcomes that one is trying to promote, either at the individual level or at the level of the population being served. The applications also should demonstrate that the research that's being used has a reasonable potential for being uh, practically implemented in the community and scalable up to a larger, uh, larger number of individuals. And also, the application should show clear evidence of a collaboration between academic research centers and community-based organizations. Now, many topics are appropriate to this a funding opportunity, but arts-related topics are a perfect fit for this. Um, we're welcome to any topic that provides a link between science and practice. And arts approaches could be either active approaches or passive approaches. The population that's being targeted could be the healthy older adult population or adults living with age-related illness or disability, including dementia. But importantly, any intervention studies are really going to require that participating community programs are poised to conform to the needs of a research study. So I thought I'd offer just a quick example of an evidence-based arts approach that's been NIA funded uh, that would be the kind of a thing that could form the basis for one of these proposals. And this is work by Drs. Helga and Tony Noyce, who are a husband and wife drama instructor, actor, psychologist team who've been examining through their uh, research funding how acting facilitates memory and cognition in older adults. And currently, the, the, these um, investigators are partnering with Dr. Art Kramer, who directs the Neuroimaging Center at the University of Illinois, to find out how acting training changes brain structure. So one of the findings that they have published has demonstrated that a four-week course in theater that focuses on participating in acting, not just memorizing a script, led to improvements in problem solving and word recall in older people, two important areas of cognitive function. And they found that a visual arts course of similar length didn't lead to those kinds of cognitive abilities. So that's just one sort of example of the kind of evidence-based research that we're talking about promoting and taking up to scale in the community. Under this funding announcement, so far there have been two projects funded to date. Uh, the first is a project to Linda Terry that's addressing physical function in older adults with dementia. And the second, about which we'll be hearing very shortly, uh, is one to Dr. Julian Johnson at the University of California in San Francisco on uh, using community choirs to promote healthy aging and independence of older adults. So we'll hear more about that in just a moment. But what about you? If you have an idea for a project, what should you do? So the first step is to sort of develop the outlines of your research project and form your community organization researcher alliance. And then together, what you need to do is to prepare a one-page statement of your specific scientific aims, including the approach you plan to take, the hypotheses you, tend to, you intend to test, um, and what potential scientific and public health impact you believe your research will have. And then you can send that to us at the National Institute on Aging. So each funding announcement that we have has an individual who's identified as the contact. 
In this case, it's my colleague, Dr. Jonathan King, whose email is listed here. And he may not be the person that you ultimately work with, but he can direct you towards the right person within our institute that can help you with your proposal. So um, I'm happy to hear questions about this later on, but in the meantime, what I'd like to do now is turn over the microphone to uh, Dr. Julian Johnson at UCSF, who's going to talk about uh, this other project that's been funded under this announcement. Thank you so much, Liz, for your um, transition there, and I'm very honored to be part of this webinar and also talking with the folks who are listening in. Um, I'm actually a cognitive neuroscientist at the University of California, San Francisco, but I'm also a musician, so I'm very interested in this intersection between arts and um, aging. So today what I'm going to do is talk about a new grant that we just received from the National Institute on Aging to study the efficacy of a community choir program for promoting health and well-being of culturally diverse older adults and also examine its cost effectiveness. Our grant was submitted in response to the program announcement that Dr. Nielsen just discussed. So this came at a good time because um, the number of adults throughout the world is rapidly increasing. And in the United States, the number of adults over age 65 will almost double by 2030. And this will also include a large proportion of older adults who come from diverse racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic backgrounds. So there's an immediate need to develop novel methods for promoting health and well-being of older adults in our community. And as Dr. Nielsen mentioned, addressing health and well-being both in the clinic and our community is an important approach. Now, community arts programs may be one particularly novel way to promote health. However, the creative arts are not yet widely recognized as one way to promote health, despite a number of research studies. So today, I will focus on one specific creative arts, in particular choral singing. And there are many unique aspects that make choral singing a potentially good method for promoting health and independence in the community. For example, choral singing is a multifactorial activity that involves a wide range of social, uh, cognitive, physical, and emotional processes. You probably all know what I'm talking about. It also provides an opportunity for cultural expression. And it's quite a popular activity in the United States and in the world, actually. And a Chorus America study recently reported that about 32.5 million adults sing, currently sing in choirs. But importantly, choral singing is also relatively low cost to implement and can be translated and expanded into a variety of community settings, such as senior centers, um, et cetera. And although there is not yet a comprehensive model for why choral singing might promote healthy aging, we decided it was a good candidate to further examine in a well-constructed research study. And our study design and grant was built upon Jean Cohen's uh, former study that found um, fewer falls, fewer doctor visits, less loneliness, and higher morale in a group of older adults who sang in a choir for one year compared to controls. So there were definitely important preparations for putting this grant proposal together. And um, I had the opportunity on a sabbatical to go to travel to Finland as a Fulbright scholar to study what, what singing cultures look like. And it turned out that in the, the in Uvascula, Finland, um, in a town of about 125,000 people, there were six choirs that were dedicated just to older adults. So I had the opportunity to, to uh, think about quality of life um, of those older adult choir singers in Finland, which was a, very important for um, forming the basis for the grant that I did when I got back. And after I got back from Finland, um, I also connected with the San Francisco Community Music Center. Um, I really had the desire to think about uh, implementing a research project in the community and felt it was important to um, take in or tap into the services of professional musicians. Um, and it just turned out that the Community Music Center had just been funded uh, by a MetLife, MetLife Foundation grant. So it was a good timing. And then after that, I also connected with the San Francisco Department of Aging and Adult Services because we wanted to um, actually deliver the community choirs within the senior center um, setting within San Francisco. And it turned out that every senior center that I contacted was very, very interested in participating in this project. And in, in the end, we recruited 12 centers um, and the Community Music Center for this grant proposal. 
So you can see here, I think one of the important aspects of the grant is that this was really a three-way partnership. So while the Department of Aging and Adult Services is helping provide the um, setting for the community choirs, the Community Music Center is helping provide the professional music choral directors and the music direction, and then UCSF is directing the evaluation of the effect of this program. Now we have two specific aims. Um, the first one is to evaluate the efficacy of the one-year community choir program on both health and well-being. And the second is to evaluate the cost and, and importantly, the cost effectiveness. And just to give you a sense for the design of the study, it, it, actually this was something that took many months of discussion with our statistician, um, the senior centers, and the community music center. This We definitely put this grant together in partnership of thinking about all the issues, the challenges of, of doing research in the community with the challenges of doing a well-designed research study. So we decided on the using one year of a choir where we would do assessments of health and well-being at baseline after six months and then after one year. And this design was really based, again, on Gene Cohen's prior work. And our outcomes will focus on health and well-being. So for our primary outcomes, we, we look at physical function, including strength, balance, and walking speed, and also depressive symptoms and loneliness. And our secondary outcomes uh, will be a little bit more heterogeneous. Uh, we will look at cognition, uh, well-being in terms of quality of life, sense of control, and interest in life, and also emotional and social support. So trying to get at some of these aspects of the social benefits of singing in a choir. Um, also looking at shortness of breath and voice quality to try to get closer to some of the, the um, uh, uh, biological systems that are involved when you're, when you're singing. And then for the cost and cost effectiveness, um, Dr. Wendy Max, who's a health economist, will actually help us um, look at the health care services used in falls and then look um, using those in an algorithm to um, address cost effectiveness. Um, we were fortunate to get funded with our grant about the same time that the NIH Toolbox released its new um, testing um, battery, and we're going to use three out, of the, three out of the four testing modules and, and also with some legacy um, outcomes uh, to, to actually assess um, health and well-being. And this next slide here is busy, and it's really not meant to be, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, except to say that um, I mentioned earlier that we don't have a well-developed conceptual framework for, for the reasons why community choir singing actually works, um, in addition to other co creative arts. Um, and I, this is an attempt to take the multifactorial components of choir singing, link them to some biological measures, mechanisms, and then think about what outcomes we can actually test in a research study. So I won't go into this in detail. And this is not complete, and you, the arrows you know, don't necessarily go in that direction, you know, straight from one to the next box. But this is a, an attempt to set up a conceptual model for how we might think about um, the effect of choir singing on health. So in a little bit more detail in terms of the research design, uh, we will use a cluster randomized waitlist controlled trial so that each center will be randomly assigned to either start the choir immediately. So you'll see up on the top part, uh, we'll, it, we'll enroll at two sites simultaneously. We won't know which one will start the choir immediately and which one will wait six months. But this will allow us to actually look at a use a randomized control trial design for the first six months. And you can see with this blue arrow here that we will have um, um, par participants who are interested in singing in a choir but are willing to wait six months. Um, and then we can look compared to those who start the choir immediately compared to the controls who will eventually start the choir. And then we can look at with in-person change over six months and then a year with both, of, both arms of that um, trial design. And this was really the brainchild of our statistician, Stephen Gregorich. Um, as I mentioned, we spent a lot of time debating about how to make this work in the community and do this um, with high scientific rigor. And here it just gives you an idea that, of course, we can't um, start all 12 choirs at once in the different sites. So we um, will start over, over the next four years. Uh, we have two pairs of, of choirs or sites that will start um, that will allow us to um, implement the 12 choirs and with a total sample size of about 400 to 450 over the course of five years. We're very excited about this. 
And I also want to mention that um, the majority of the participants in our senior centers are culturally diverse, um, including many who will be monolingual Spanish speakers. So we've, we've really happy to have the, the collaboration with the Community Music Center, who have many bilingual music directors and resources. So um, we will be able to tap into um, that resource also. So if this study is successful, the results may increase awareness about the health benefits of community arts programs for older adults. Um, it would also increase the community arts programs as potentially affordable and sustainable means to improve health of older adults, but also emphasize the importance of interagency community partnerships, such as community music centers or music groups and senior centers or other health um, promoting agencies in the community. And also to encourage the community arts programs to expand their reach to, to more culturally diverse older adults as this subpopulation is going to increase um, in, importantly in the, in the future. And I think we need to think about uh, also having res, uh, resources for promoting health for um, culturally diverse older adults. And I wanted to um, quickly thank the National Institute on Aging for funding this program and the Fulbright Foundation for allowing me to think about um, this topic. And the research team here at UCSF, Anita Stewart, Anna Nopoulos, Stephen Gregorich, and Wendy Max. And of course, we couldn't do this study without um, a really strong partnership with the Community Music Center in San Francisco and also the Department of Aging and Adult Services Senior Centers. Um, so thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Johnson. Uh, this is uh, Suni Langer again from the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, we'll have our final speaker to say a few words. Uh, really grateful to have her, Marla Bush, who's been a tremendously helpful colleague on the task force, on the Interagency Task Force in the Arts and Human Development. She's representing the Office of External Affairs, the Administration for Community Living within the part, Department of Health and Human Services. She works with us. Assistant Secretary of Health, uh, Kathy Greenlee, who some of you might remember if you had tuned into our very first one of these webinars, she helped kick off this whole webinar series, uh, Secretary Greenlee, Assistant Secretary Greenlee did. So Marla, Hi. take it away. Oh, I'm, I'm so pleased to see so many people on the call, and I'm glad that I can be here and represent uh, Kathy Greenlee, who now wears two hats. She's the administrator for the newly formed Administration for Community Living and she's also still the Assistant Secretary for Aging. And from the very beginning, she's been really an enthusiastic supporter of the work of the task force. And um, I think NEA has just done a fabulous job on this. Um, as she stated on a, a NEA blog, she said, arts aren't just a nice thing to have, but they're key motivations for maintaining and improving one's health and well-being. So she's sorry she can't be here today, but I'm pleased that I can be here and make a few remarks from both the policy and the practitioner points of view. Um, I don't know who's on the phone, so for those of you who aren't familiar with the work of the Administration on Aging, we're part of, I said, the newly created Administration for Community Living. And this office brings together under one roof the Administration on Aging, the Administration on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, and the HH Office on Disability. So our mission is to maximize independence, well-being, and health of older adults, people with disabilities, and their families and caregivers. Um, the specific mission of the Administration on Aging is to develop comprehensive, coordinated, and cost-effective systems of home and community-based services for older individuals and their caregivers. So we support a variety of programs across the country. Um, including senior center programs where many of the art-related activities do take place. And our collaboration with the National Institute on Aging on trans translational research, um, we hope will have a really direct and significant impact on the kinds of programs we might be able to fund and support. We're really big on evidence-based, cost-effective programs. And we're currently funding states to provide evidence-based disease and disability prevention programs that empower older adults to take care, take control of their health. So you can go on our new website, just uh, went up yesterday, www.acl.gov, and you can see a list of these programs. Hopefully we'll be able to make the same case for the importance of 
art programs for older people. So I'm very excited to hear about Dr. Johnson's research, which forges the link between researchers and practitioners at the community level. And I'm really glad that she's gotten um, our San Francisco program to partner in 12 senior centers. That's wonderful. In my private life, uh, I'm a teaching artist for a local program which brings the arts into senior centers and adult aid care programs. I have a program of um, dance. So I know firsthand why we need good research to help our organizations make a case for funding and so we can choose the most effective interventions and tools. Um, in this program that, I'm, that I work for on, on, on the side, um, teaching artists submit pre- and post-evaluations of our interventions in the visual arts, movement, music, and poetry. And we maintain data from our workshops on 13 different health behaviors um, and measure engagement, social interaction, and the frequency by which our participants reminisce. But this data, data is all observational. We really need the hard evidence that this makes a difference. We need to know what really works, and we need better tools for evaluating our impact. Uh, and we also need effective tools to engage the caregivers and our families in interventions. So we're really excited about this collaboration among federal agencies, and I hope that this call has you excited and gives you ideas about the research that you can conduct. Thank you so much for participating today. Thank you very much, Marla. Um, again, this is Sunil Iyengar, Director of Research and Analysis of the National Endowment for the Arts, and we're here to take your questions. All the speakers are online. Um, please use the Q&A box to type in your questions if you have them or comments, and we'd be happy to answer those. Um, I might add, just while we're waiting, uh, you know, Dr. Johnson, maybe you could uh, give us a sense of how difficult or how easy was it to recruit or connect with your local, your community music centers. Um, I think a lot of people out there, I think it's safe to say, particularly in the arts organization world and arts practitioners are eager to help, as, as they say, and, you know, willing to look, you know, be, be uh, you know, find ways to partner with uh, look with researchers in their midst who may want to conduct such studies. Uh, was it really hard to track those organizations down, or how did, how did you do that? That's a great question, Sunil. Um, it was actually much easier than I thought it was to get the support of the community music center and the senior centers. Um, like I mentioned, I think every senior center I talked to personally agreed to be part of the study. And I do have to credit, um, you know, the MetLife Foundation program for doing several of these research um, programs already in the community. And the Community Music Center here in San Francisco had um, just received one of those grants. So they were, we were kind of thinking already on the same, the, the same topic of they were interested in documenting the effect of these choir program on the, the older adults in their one choir, Coro Solera, whereas I was thinking of doing a larger um, study scale, larger scale study and, and really trying to pin down um, more specific health outcomes. So it was a really nice extension from the interest in this community music program. Um, I don't, can't say I have uh, experience working with other community organizations in other cities, so I don't know how open to research uh, other community music or arts programs are, but I was, I was just really impressed with how easy it was. The challenging part was deciding on the design. That was the hard part. And we worked together you know, to do that over months. Great. Thank you very much. Um, there's a question here uh, regarding the grant opportunity that uh, Liz just spoke about. Uh, the question is, what is the grant period for those two program announcements, and what's the start end date? Is it a multi-year grant? Uh, Liz? Yes, yeah, so this is one of the standing program announcements that we have in what's called the NIH guide. And these are typically active for up to three years and then potentially renewed or changed or withdrawn. So this one is, uh, I don't remember the exact date, but I think it's certainly active until 2014. Uh, the submission dates for this are the standard submission dates. If you go to the program announcement, you can actually see the specific dates. The dates are different different for the R01 and the R21. Um, but you can submit 
in, in any of our three annual cycles for uh, funding for these opportunities. And the R01 is a typically up to five year grant. So I believe Julene's project is five years. Um, it doesn't have to be five years, but it can be. Uh, depends really on the, the research demands of the project that you're submitting. The R21 is a two year exploratory developmental project. Uh, that's really for something that uh, sort of isn't ready for programmatic research, but needs to some kind of development, either of a measure or of some sort of new approach or intervention. Um, and that would be two years, typically, uh, you know, people do a lot of developmental work in the first year and then have a little bit less funding for the second year. Um, thank you, Liz. Before I go to, uh, there's a couple of questions for um, Dr. Johnson. Before I go to her, um, there's another question saying, once a translational proposal has been submitted, is there any flexibility in revising the proposed intervention before it begins? Uh, well, there's always there are always changes that occur as people sort of get their get on the ground and get running and, and discover that something that they'd anticipated doesn't turn out exactly the way they had proposed. But really, the expectation is that you've done, especially for an R01 submission, that you've done considerable pilot work to demonstrate feasibility and test your methods before you submit the application to the NIH, uh, so that you've worked out those sorts of questions. Now that said, um, you know actually being in the field and, and, and implementing the intervention sometimes runs into challenges where you need to steer a little bit in different course. Modest things one can easily adjust. Uh, major things really require a discussion with the funding agency. Thank you. Uh, before I go to Dr. Johnson for a couple of questions that have arrived for her, um, I just wanted to take a stab at answering a couple. Uh, one is, what types of studies have been done regarding the visual arts? Um, so by no means is this a comprehensive list, but I can tell you that a couple of the publications I've referred to so far may be a good starting point. Uh, Particularly, I would look at the report that we just released today that we talked that uh, Marie and I just spoke about, um, the arts and aging, building the science from that uh, September workshop with the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, there were some presentations concerning, particularly in long-term care facilities, the use of visual arts and design uh, and what it does for the environment, care environment of those uh, facilities as well as um, kind of positive social um, and emotional and cognitive outcomes potentially for the, uh, the beneficiary of that design. So in other words, the people who live in those facilities, uh, studies of that. So there's some literature on that, but I think also the Arts and Human Development white paper that Marie referenced has a collection of studies that relate to also the visual arts. Um, again, by no means comprehensive, and that's part of the gap analysis that we're hoping to do uh, for each phase of the lifespan. So our next step is to look at early childhood and uh, youth. Um, okay, so, um, and then another question was, is the website address for, that Marla Bush referenced, www.acl.gov. Yes. I think that's correct. Yes, correct, that's Marla? Correct. Or you can always type in administration okay, on aging if you want to go directly to that website. Okay, great. Thanks. Now, the questions that I referred to for Dr. Johnson, I'm going to try to combine them here. Uh, one is, um, what were some of the challenges in identifying proper health outcomes in your study? And the other question has to do with that partnership thing we were talking about. What specific obstacles did you experience in creating a shared vision between your partner groups or organizations, and how did you overcome them? So one question is, again, how difficult was it to create a, and uh, identify the health outcomes? And the other one is, what obstacles, if any, did you encounter in forming the partnership? Right, so I'll take the, the first question, which is the, uh, regarding the, health, the outcomes. How do we select them? Well, I was fortunate to um, have the help of Anita Stewart who has um, worked for many years in developing physical activity interventions and measuring the health outcomes of uh, other types of interventions, even within the community. So one of our challenges was to um, think about what were the proposed components of choir singing and what did we think that we were actually going to be affecting um, when, when somebody sings in a choir. For example, uh, we thought that posture and maybe lower body strength might be improved. Uh, we thought uh, maybe learning new lyrics and melodies might, you know, kind of stimulate the cognition and the brain and, and, and stimulate memory. So we actually, you know, took, took this task in a pretty structured way where we identified the components of the arts intervention, 
looked at the biological mechanism that we thought would be affected, whether it be brain, you know, lower body strength, social network size. And then what we did is we went to the literature and very carefully looked for other health outcomes that looked at, for example, you know, memory function or um, social network size or depressive symptoms. And then our other challenge was we also had to find measures that were both in English and Spanish. So we had, um, you know, we, we spent many, many months thinking about um, what these might look like. I think the one thing that's lacking um, in our outcomes is something that's specifically related to music. And I think that was, it was going to be too hard for us to think about using a music intervention and then measuring health. But I think future studies should very carefully think about uh, looking at some music-specific outcomes. Um, so, I, you know, I think there was, it was a long process, and luckily uh, Dr. Anita Stewart has a lot of experience selecting measures and developing measures, um, so we had that expertise. So the second question um, it was, was about how difficult was it to, can you remind me, Sunil, of the, the, the partnership and some obstacles? Yes, certainly. Uh, what specific obstacles did you experience in, share, in creating a shared vision between your partner groups and organizations, and how did you overcome them? So, um, you know, I don't have a list of specific obstacles. I think my strategy was to do a lot of in-person meetings. So um, I met multiple times with the team at the Community Music Center, and we were you know, developing these ideas together. And as you might expect, there's, there's some tension between, you know, what you want to do as a researcher and what the, how you want to present and do a, a study of the arts in the community. And so we went back and forth about um, how long should the intervention be. You know, we did not, the Community Music Center, for example, did not want to do a short intervention, and we wanted to base it on Jean's um, Cohen study. Um, the next step, of course, was, was you know, personally meeting with the people at the individual senior centers and getting their feedback on the design and would they be willing to do this randomized, cluster randomized design and, you know, and of course it was a frustrating, you know, aspect of the design because we're going to be recruiting at two sites and then need, the sites don't know which one is going to have to then wait six months versus start. And that was negotiated. We, we, you know, we, we realized that we couldn't do that a year. That, was, that seemed impossible to do in the community. And the community centers told me that they were willing to do, you know, six months, even though that was going to be hard for them to do from a programmatic perspective because, of course, having a choir, a weekly choir in their senior center would require having, um, you know, rooms available, et cetera, and all that gets planned many, many months ahead of time. I wanted to point out that the, the second um, aim, which is the cost and cost effectiveness, was actually suggested by several of the senior center directors, that they were saying that they had increasing difficulty with arguing um, to keep the arts programs within their programming and keeping funding for that. So that was their idea. So I, I have to say there weren't a lot of ob what I would call obstacles. It was more of a process of negotiation of what is what will work in the community um, versus what will how we how will we be able to design a, a, a high quality study so we actually get a, a big bang for the buck and we really learn something and rather than doing another small study that we'd have kind of you know unequivocal or, uh, results that don't tell us a lot so it was it was just a process of negotiation. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Uh, several more questions rolling in for you. So to get you, let you catch your breath, I'm going to uh, ask a question again for Liz, uh, try to frame this question. Um, so the question is, uh, Dr. Johnson built her study off another longitudinal study conducted by Jean Cohen, MD, to expand the sample size, strengthen the methodology, uh, et cetera, which is very helpful to the current arts, aging, and research uh, that involves small sample sizes and limited methodology. Um, and she's referring here, the questioner is referring to the uh, Jean Cohen study, which was co-funded by the NEA, actually, and NIA um, many, many years ago. Uh, the question is, would it be a good strategy for new proposals to do the same? Uh, that's to build off, I suppose, previous longitudinal type study designs to strengthen the field in ways that are now lacking. Uh, does, do you, can you respond to that maybe? I mean, I think that's certainly uh, one way to go. I mean, diff uh, scaling something that's been pr shown to be effective in a smaller study up to the, to the level to which it can be deployed to a number of um, organizations in the community is certainly one of the goals of 
of this funding announcement. You know, there may be other fundamental research that's been done, say, that's somewhat more laboratory-based that would be appropriate for trying to bring out and implement somehow in an intervention in the community. Um, so, there, you know, there are any number of, of research bases that could be the launching point, but that certainly is one. Thank you. And, and it just occurred to me, hearing Dr. Johnson a moment ago, uh, that cost effectiveness, in fact, was one of the topics that uh, the NEA and the National Institute on Aging were very interested in, and our co-sponsors at the NIH uh, when we convened that National Academies workshop. So that's another topic that is, goes into, uh, that's, that's gone into in some detail in the uh, workshop summary. Uh, there were specific presentations about uh, using, doing cost-benefit analyses with arts interventions and, the, and, and some of the strengths of existing analyses and weaknesses. So I think that'll be an interesting area, as, particularly since um, Dr. Johnson mentioned that uh, managers of these senior centers were very interested in that topic. Okay, um, another question before we go to Dr. Johnson. Um, either Marie or Liz, do you have any thoughts on this? Or even Julian, if you do. Um, how do we find out what research has already been done through NIH? Um, in a topic we are thinking of researching. Um, and I should just add here that, you know, of course, that's part of the task of what the any, this task force has set for itself is to identify such research through comprehensive literature reviews. Um, but for the time being, I don't know if there's an easy answer to that. Um, um, any thoughts Khalil, from you? Marie? I would suggest that if you're not, if the person who's asking the question is not already familiar, there is a website called Reporter on the NIH website that will allow you to go in and search by, you can do a text search, you can do a category search. Uh, quite honestly, I don't think that there's actually an arts category, but it would be a means, if you do a text search, of seeing what might have been funded, uh, uh, what is being funded currently, um, and to help to refine one's thoughts about uh, what one might want to propose. Of course, you need to do a basic literature search prior to that so that you'll find out what's been uh, funded in the distant past, which has led to publications. But if you want to know what's currently being funded, the reporter website is a great resource. Great. Is that anything else, Liz? Yeah, I just wanted to add that, that so, for example, taking the example that I mentioned in my presentation about the theater intervention, so while one could search the reporter for theater projects, um, really that project is within the context of the whole research uh, field looking at cognitive interventions for healthy cognitive aging. And so, you know, you might also want to look through reporter and, and other lit searches for the outcomes that you're interested in and, and get a handle on what sort of intervention programs already exist that may not be arts-based and, and situate your project within that context. Great. Both of the suggestions are extremely helpful. Um, so I'm going to go back to Dr. Johnson with a couple of questions. Um, one is, uh, how might your results contribute to the development of the conceptual framework, and what do you see as next steps? Um, actually, that's an interesting question insofar as um, the conceptual framework was something that I think some of the studies that were reviewed in the National Academies workshop uh, were deemed to have been somewhat lacking in understanding the framework, the, the mechanism of action, if you will, of the arts working on older adults. So I was really pleased to see that outline of the conceptual framework. So anyway, the question is, how might your results contribute to the development of the conceptual framework, and what do you see as next steps? That's one question. So, yes. So I think um, I look to my colleagues who have studied physical activity for 20 years and look at how they very systematically developed a conceptual model for how physical activity has an impact on health and, and mainly health and well-being, I guess you could say also. And I, I think what you see there is that they've identified the components of physical activity that are, that are important and then linked them to biological mechanisms. And I think the majority of the arts studies have not yet done this very well. And, you know, it's not an easy task, frankly, you know, to be able to identify what are the actual biological mechanisms that are involved when somebody's either listening to music, producing music, creating music, et cetera. So I think, you know, some of the next steps need to be um, targeting, targeting some of these biological mechanisms um, a little more closely. And we attempted to do that in, in the, the study that we just got funded in that we are, rather than just looking at falls, or, or which was one of the outcomes that was in the Gene Cohen study, but we're actually going to measure strength or we're going to measure balance. 
and you know in walking speed. So we're trying to get a little bit closer to the what is that biological mechanism that might be um, affecting this. And of course, I'm as a cognitive neuroscientist, I'm very interested in the brain mechanisms and have thought about this in the context of neurodegenerative diseases more. But I think that's um, also an area that would be very helpful and. Um, I know with Art Kramer and, uh, and the Noises are partnering together to try to document the effect of um, the theater for older adults on, uh, on brain function. So I think that's, that's kind of the future directions. And I would love to see you know, people developing um, better measurements of music behaviors and engagement in music and, and, um, and, and how to actually measure the impact of music on the body and the mind. Great. And uh, one of the questions is actually about the cost effectiveness aspect that we talked about a bit earlier, Dr. Johnson. Um, the question is they would like you to talk a bit about what measures were used. And I know I think this phase is still being planned, correct? But what measures were used in evaluating cost effectiveness against other programs and other disciplines or against health interventions? Uh, did um, artist compensation play a role in the evaluation of cost effectiveness? That's a big question, but maybe you can just speak for a moment about th your thinking currently about the cost effectiveness part of the evaluation. Sure. So we are, as I mentioned, um, we're collaborating with uh, Dr. Wendy Max, who's a health economist, who helped us um, identify the um, outcomes that we're going to look at to, to track cost. And there's a whole list of things like what is the cost of the choir director for preparation time conducting, you know, the training program, the marketing, advertising, you know, piano rental, flyers, et cetera, all of those traditional costs will be tracked. But in addition to that, we will also um, measure health-related quality of life using the EQ5D, which is commonly used in um, uh, cost-effectiveness studies, and also healthcare utilization and falls. So what Dr. Max will do is she is able to then um, develop, use her theoretical models of the cost of a fall, the cost of going to the doctor, and put it into a model that takes into account the costs that actually are, are required to run the choir program for the year. And then, you, and then she, she will look at the relative expense of that. Do you actually get, does it cost more to run the choir than what, you, what you're getting in terms of less, for example, less visits to the doctor and what that, what that might look like. So this is, um, we're still in the, um, the development stage of this, um, meaning we're, we're just starting the study. We just started enrolling the two sites um, last month. So we will shortly begin to collect this information and we'll have that at the end of the study. Hope that answered your question. Uh, I think it might have uh, answered her question. Um, so that's great. Uh, now I just wanted to, I'm going to take a stab at answering this question and tell me if I'm wrong. And that can kind of, um, oh, and the, 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 by the way, the questioner just chimed in and said, yes, great answer. Okay. So <laughs> apparently you did answer it very well. Uh, it's good to know we, we get so little grat instant gratification on this end. Uh, so I'm going to now um, try to answer this question and tell me if I'm answering it correctly, Jolene, um, and then we can close it out. Uh, because I find it a very interesting question. I mean, the question is essentially about the, uh, the PowerPoint you showed um, where you showed that there, at one point the choir waits for six months to do another, you know, before, before starting, right? And, and I think the way you explained it was it was almost an ingenious method of, of study design where you were looking at offering a control group uh, alongside the, um, the, the intervention, the, the singing, and, do, and alternating so that you wouldn't have to basically deny choral participation for a whole population. That's correct. Is that correct? That's correct. And, and the reason I, I, so the question had simply been, what was the six months lag for? So I think hopefully that someone answers it. But the bigger point I take away from uh, that, that slide was that, you know, we really kind of pressed to think of really inventive methods to establish comparison groups and control groups when you do these kinds of studies. And I know that when you presented back in September to the National Academies workshop, and similarly others did, um, there was a sense that um, you know, part of the infrastructure for this research is going to have to take into account interdisciplinary teams that may be needed, inclusive of statisticians, um, you know, arts practitioners, and uh, methodologists to really figure out how to set up a study to extract, um, you know, uh, the best data. 
And I think, you know, comparison and control groups seem to be an issue with a lot of these kinds of studies. So I guess hats off for coming up with a method of doing it. No, I would agree. That I would say that was yeah, the biggest so, um, obstacle to our designing our grant was what the method would look like in terms of control groups. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult to think of a good control group for an arts participation uh, because there's so many components to it, and there's a social component and a you know a, a music component, and and I think again our colleagues who study physical activity have 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 done a good job of thinking about what the controls might be. Um, for example, stretching, where you still have a stretching class, but you don't have a um, you know an active uh, physical activity group or something. So I think this is an area we need to really carefully think about and together think about it because there, it's not real obvious what are the best uh, designs yet to, to study the arts. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, I need to close this down now, but I want to say again, thanks everyone for participating. Uh, I hope we've learned a lot collectively and that you'll continue to tune into these webinars. Uh, please do go to our new website, um, www.arts.gov slash national slash task force, a dedicated web page to the task force. And I want to thank all of our speakers, uh, Marie, uh, Liz, um, Marla, and Julien, and everyone else for participating and helping us with this webinar. Thank you, and please join us in April.